Intro Chemistry Charles Law Experiment There are four properties of gases that are interrelated. The amount of a gas, usually measured in moles, pressure of a gas, temperature of a gas, and volume of a gas. To understand the effect of varying these properties, we keep two variables constant. We change one variable and see the effect on the fourth variable. In this experiment, we will keep pressure and moles of gas constant, but we'll vary temperature and see its effect on volume. So how does volume of a gas change with temperature? Have you ever roasted marshmallows? When you heat up a marshmallow, it expands. Why? Because gases expand with increasing temperature. Look at the graph below. Here we have volume of a gas in milliliters versus temperature of a gas in kelvins. Start with one milliliter of gas at 100 kelvin. If we double the kelvin temperature and go to 200 kelvin, what happens to the volume? Well, the volume doubles. It goes up to two milliliters. What happens when you increase the kelvin temperature by a factor of four, from 100 to 400? Well, then the volume increases by a factor of four, one mil to four mils, and so on. So as the temperature increases, the gas volume increases proportionately. As the Kelvin temperature decreases, the gas volume decreases proportionately. Now, we have to use the Kelvin scale. It's an absolute scale. Celsius or Fahrenheit will not work. Think about this. Let's say the temperature was minus 20 degrees Celsius and the volume was one milliliter. And we warm the temperature up from minus 20 up to plus 10. What's the volume? Well, by what factor has the temperature increased? We can't figure out a factor because we're going from a negative to a positive value. That's increasing, but the magnitude is actually decreased. You see, these calculations make no sense unless you use an absolute scale such as the Kelvin scale. So how do we convert between Kelvin and Celsius? Take a look at this graph. The red line is the temperature in degrees Celsius versus volume of a gas. And here it's plotted temperature in Kelvin versus volume of a gas. You can see that the Kelvin temperature it runs parallel to the Celsius temperature. It's always this much higher. This much is 273 degrees. So Kelvin is degrees Celsius plus 273. Take room temperature for example, 20 degrees C. What is that in Kelvin? Well you simply add 273 to it and get 293. How about in the reverse? If you want to go from Kelvin to Celsius, you simply subtract 273. Do you see it here? 273 to 0. So let's take the boiling point of water is 373 Kelvin. What is that in Celsius? You simply subtract 273. And that's equal to what 100 Celsius. So the Kelvin temperature is 273 higher than the Celsius temperature. We need to learn how to solve problems involving temperature and volume. And to do that, you should use the general, logical, foolproof method of problem solving that you should always use. Why a big title? Because you should always use it. This is the problem solving method that you would do in your head. It's the way you would solve things when you're not in school. Let me give you some examples. Say you want to buy roses for someone special, but you don't have a lot to spend. Three roses cost only four dollars, but three roses are not enough. Perhaps you could afford to buy nine roses. Well, how much do nine roses cost? So three roses cost four dollars. Nine roses cost how much? You know the answer. You immediately think in your head twelve dollars. Well, how did you do this? Well, you figured that buying nine roses would cost three times as much as buying three roses. So you multiplied four dollars times three. Three is the ratio of nine roses over three roses. If you're going to buy three times as many roses, then they cost three times as much. It's pure, simple logic. It works every time. Let's put this thought process on paper. Three roses cost four dollars. Nine roses cost x dollars. To solve for dollars, start with the dollars you know multiply by a ratio of roses over roses. The unit of roses will cancel, 
the unit of dollar is all that's left. What you start with is what you wind up with. Nine roses is three times more than three roses, so the ratio is three to one, so you multiply four dollars times three. Cost increases proportionately with quantity. Let's try another one. Your tires are wearing thin, but tires are expensive, and your pocketbook is also thin. So you figure you can get by by replacing only the front two tires. However, when you go to Canadian Tire, you are pleasantly surprised to find that tires are on sale. Only $90 for two tires. Can you afford to replace all four tires? Now picture yourself here at the desk, about ready to order tires from the guy. How much do four tires cost? You think two tires cost $90, four tires cost how much? Well, I know you figured it out. You figured $180 for four tires. And how did you do it? Well, you figured that buying four tires would cost twice as much as buying two tires. So you multiplied $90 times two. Two is the ratio of four tires over two tires. On paper, what would that look like? Well, two tires cost $90 four tires cost X dollars. You want to solve for dollars, so start with dollars. Multiply by the ratio of tires that makes sense. It makes sense that you put the big number over the small number, four over two. You know the cost has to increase by the same factor, by a factor of two, $180. Cost increases proportionally with quantity. Very simple. It's the way you would do it when you're not at school. Now, no intelligent person would even think of solving a problem by the method of ratio and proportion. Here it is. $90 over 2t equals x dollars over 4t. Now, we rearrange. This is what you're taught in school, right? Forget what you're taught in school. Then you say that 2t times x dollars is 4t times $90. The units don't make any sense. Let's drop them out. That's what you do. Then we'll say 2x equals 4 times 9 is 360. x is equal to 360 divided by 2. x is equal to $180. You would never do that. You would not do that when you go to buy tires. You would not take out a piece of paper and do a ratio and proportion. Don't ever do this. Don't do it in school either. Instead, use logical statements. You understand the problem, you'll get it right. Let's do another example. The temperature of a gas is 27 degrees Celsius. At what Kelvin temperature will its volume A double, B triple, C decrease to one half its original volume? Well, first we have to convert Celsius to Kelvins. So remember that Kelvin is simply 273 plus the Celsius. So 27 Celsius is 300 Kelvin. So we can say the final temperature will be the initial temperature, 300 Kelvin, times the ratio by which the volume doubles. This is the volume. The volume doubles, so the Kelvin temperature must have doubled. 2 over 1 times 300 is 600. In the second problem, if the volume tripled, increased by a factor of 3, then the Kelvin temperature must increase by a factor of 3, so 300 Kelvin becomes 900 Kelvin. In the third example, the volume decreases by a factor of 2, so 300 Kelvin times 1 half is 150 Kelvin. The volume doubles when the Kelvin temperature doubles, it triples when the Kelvin temperature triples. Problem number 4. A gas occupies 2 liters at 100 Kelvin. What volume will the gas occupy at 300 Kelvin? Will the volume increase or decrease is your first question. Well, it's going to increase because the temperature is increasing. By what factor? It'll increase by the same factor as the temperature is increasing. On paper, we could write it this way. This is in our head how we would think it. At 100 Kelvin, the gas volume is 2 liters. At 300 Kelvin, it's going to be greater by that factor, right? So x liters, start with what you want to solve for, 2 liters. Make a ratio that makes sense. It's going to increase by the same factor. The Kelvin temperature increases by a factor of 3, 6 liters. Problem number 5. A gas occupies 555 mils at 100 degrees C. What volume will the gas occupy at 0 degrees C? Okay, so note that the gas is cooled. It's cooled from the boiling point of water to the freezing point of water. 
so its volume has to decrease. It's going to decrease by the same factor by which the Kelvin temperature decreases, so we need to convert to Kelvin. So the boiling point is 100. What's that in Kelvin? Add 273, 373 Kelvin. The freezing point is 0. What's that in Kelvin? Well, it's 273. So at 373 Kelvin, the gas volume is 555 milliliters. At the freezing point of 273, the gas volume is x milliliters. So start with what you want to solve for. I want to solve for milliliters, 555. Make a ratio that makes sense. You're cooling it off. It has to get smaller. Put the small number over the large number. Again, the units will cancel. You start with mils. You'll end with mils. So 555 times 273 over 373 is 406 milliliters. Volume and temperature both decrease together. Let's look at this experiment. In this experiment, we're going to measure the amount by which a sample of air contracts when it cools from a high temperature to a low temperature, just like in the last problem. Here's the apparatus. We've got an Erlenmeyer flask full of air with a rubber stopper. The rubber stopper has a tube that's open to the atmosphere through it. And we have a pinch clamp on the tube so we can open or close that air passage. We start with it open so air can exchange freely between the atmosphere and the empty Erlenmeyer flask. We put it in a hot water bath and we're going to heat this and boil it for about 10 minutes on a stir plate. This is just a stir bar. We'll measure the temperature. As the temperature increases to the boiling point, of course the volume of gas in the flask will increase and it will escape. This flask will always be full of air, but the air is now hot. We'll then close the clamp and trap that volume of gas in here. That gas is at 100 degrees Celsius. With the clamp closed, we'll take it and immerse it in water in a sink. What happens then? Well, the sink has colder water in it. The gas will want to contract. We're going to open the valve and that will let water in to replace the volume that's left when the air contracts. Let it sit there for 10 minutes to reach equilibrium. Before we remove the flask from the sink, we'll raise it up such that the level of water in the flask will be the same as the level of water in the sink. By doing this, we'll ensure that the pressure inside the flask is the same as atmospheric pressure. So we began the experiment by heating with the clamp open so air pressure in the flask was the same as air pressure in the room. We finished the experiment with the clamp open in the sink so that the air pressure in the flask was the same as the air pressure in the room. And thus we maintain a constant pressure. And that's important because a change in pressure will change the volume of the gas. And we want to ensure that no pressure changes occurred. We only want to measure the relationship between volume and temperature. So here's the calculation that will be required for this experiment. The boiling water temperature, that would be the gas temperature initially, was 100 degrees C, and the full flask holds, for example, 550 mils of air. Then the cold water temperature in the sink, that would be the cold gas temperature, T2, was 15 degrees C, and we measured a volume of 110 mils of water that was drawn into the flask. Here's our experimental data. T1 is 100 degrees C, or 373 Kelvin. V1 is 550 mils. T2 is 15 degrees C, or 288 Kelvin. It's cooling off. The volume will decrease. This was V2. V2 will be the initial volume of 550 minus the amount of water that went into the flask. And we'll measure that, and I'll show you in the experiment. That difference is 440 mils. So that's experimental. Let's calculate theoretical V2 using Charles' law. 100 degrees Celsius, 373 Kelvin, the gas was 550 mils in volume. At 15 Celsius, or 288 Kelvin, the gas volume is x mils. x is equal to, start with volume if you're solving for volume, 
times a ratio that makes sense. It makes sense that you should put the small number over the big number because the temperature is decreasing so the volume decreases. That's 425 mils. That would be the theoretical gas volume. Let's calculate the percentage error. Measured minus the true over the true times 100. Our measured was 440 in this example. The true is 425 divided by 425 times 100 is plus three and a half percent error. All right, let's take a look at the experiment. It's a simple apparatus. We have a 500 mil Erlenmeyer flask full of only air fitted with a rubber stopper. The glass tubing is bored through the stopper. Red rubber tubing is over the glass tubing and it's fitted with a pinch clamp. Now the pinch clamp is open to start so that there's free exchange of air between the atmosphere and the flask. The flask is immersed in a beaker of hot water. After about 10 minutes of heating at the boiling point, the pinch clamp is tightly closed to trap the gas and the flask is removed from the water and allowed to cool. Here's a sink full of water near room temperature. The valve is still closed. We'll immerse the flask below the surface of the water. And then open the valve. Now when I open the valve, water begins to enter the flask. that's because the gas is cooling and as it cools it will occupy less space less volume at the lower temperature now I'm going to completely immerse the flask so that the, the temperature of the gas is the same as the temperature of the water and we'll let it sit there for about 10 minutes you can see the water creeping into the flask as the gas contracts as it cools. So after about 10 minutes of cooling, the valve is tightly closed to trap the gas and water in the flask, no more exchange. We'll need to measure the volume of the water. So at 65 milliliters, little less than expected but I know I didn't heat it at boiling point for full 10 minutes, so I'm not surprised. We'll need to determine the initial volume of the gas, which was the volume of the flask. So by filling the flask with water, measuring the volume of the water, we'll determine the initial volume of the gas when it was hot. five hundred and forty milliliters and we'll need the temperature of the water in the sink looks like 27 Celsius and that's about all we need let's go back to the lab procedure and see what else needs to be done I want to draw your attention to the data sheet in this experiment please enter your data and results exactly as shown on this sheet Note that the volume of the flask minus the volume of water drawn into the flask will give you the experimental volume of cold air. You need to include answers to several questions that are included in the lab procedure. I believe I've given you all the information you need to do that. So this concludes our study of the Charles Law experiment.